Father, we praise you again and thank you for the privilege and the opportunity of gathering around your word. It is our continuing and sincere desire to know you more perfectly, that we may serve you more faithfully. We thank you again and again that we can call you Abba Father and that you're not ashamed to call us and own us as your very own children, your very own redeemed and blood-washed family. We thank you for Jesus, our great Redeemer, our High Priest, and someday our coming King for all that he has done, for all that he is doing, and for all that he will do when he returns to receive us to himself. We thank you for the Holy Spirit whom you have sent into our midst to be our teacher and to be our guide. We know that without his anointing we can do nothing as we ought to do it. Without his inspiration and revelation we can know nothing as we ought to know it. But we do rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory that he is here and that he will guide us into the truth. I thank you that even now he is anointing every ear to hear and every heart to believe. And I thank you that my lips are now anointed to speak your word that I will speak it accurately, and that revelation knowledge would flow freely in this service tonight, unhindered and unchecked by any force. And in obedience to your word, we covet earnestly the best gifts of the Spirit, that they would be in operation and in manifestation, that the needs of this assembled body may be met in a supernatural way. I personally thank you that your word declares that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Therefore, with great boldness and confidence, I look to the greater one who indwells me. And I know that he will think through my mind. He will speak through my lips. And he will minister through this vessel of clay to your people. And for all that shall be revealed and for all that shall be manifested, we promise and covenant with you now in advance before we ever begin that we will give you alone all of the praise, the glory, the honor, the adoration, and all of the thanksgiving, for we ask it in that name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. And all who agreed with that prayer said? Amen. Then they said, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Then they said, glory to, glory to God. Then they said, good evening, Fred. Good evening, Fred. Good evening, y'all. Okay, let's turn in our Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11. We've been talking thus far from the subject, what faith is, what faith is, or how important is faith? We found out thus far that the simplest definition of faith is that faith is acting on what you believe. We found out that there is definitely a difference between belief and faith. They are two sides to the same coin, however... If all you do is believe something, even though your belief may be correct, it won't change your circumstances. But faith can. So it's very important to understand the difference. Because sometimes people can be very sincere in their belief and wonder why things are not happening because they know their own hearts and they know they believe, but they didn't move to the next phase, which was acting on what they believe. Now, there are two primary actions. The first action would be a verbal confession of what you believe, followed by whatever physical act you could perform that would support what you've said with your mouth. Want me to say that again? Oh, I could, you already knew that. Want me, anybody want me to say that again? Yes. Yeah, well, I just want to be sure you get that. Faith is acting on the word. It's acting on what you believe. Actually, faith in the natural realm works the same way that it does in the spiritual realm, only the difference is that in the spiritual realm it's based on God's word, so it's the God kind of faith. But in the natural realm, we do that all the time in everyday life. We do that on a daily basis. We act on what we believe. We believe if I put the key in the ignition, start it up, I can drive. But just believing that won't get us out of the garage. We've got to actually do it. We sit in front of a plate of food and say, I believe if I eat that food, it'll keep me from starving to death. And that's absolutely true scientifically, historically, and experientially. But you know what? You could starve to death at the table with food in front of you if you don't ever eat it. So it's still acting on what you believe. Then I said that the basic action are two things that you do. Number one, you believe something, and then the first thing you do is to confess it with your mouth. Faith, here's a rule. Faith is released by words through your mouth. You have to say it. There is no such thing as a silent prayer. There's no such thing as an unspoken request. Jesus said, when you pray, say. So if you're not saying, you didn't pray. Your only thought, no promises are based on thinking. It's only based on saying. So you have to say it. 
And so when you say it, then you follow that up with whatever action is appropriate and that you're able to perform that supports what you have said. Are you following me? So you say it first based on what the word says, then you follow that up with an action that supports what you have said. And, and the condition that you're in or the thing you're believing God for would determine what your action might be. <clears throat> for instance, let's say you're paraplegic. Let's say you're, 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 you're paralyzed all the way down to your toes. The only thing on your body that you can move is your toe. But you can hear, so you hear the word, you believe the word, and perhaps you can talk, but you, so you confess the word. And then the only action you might be able to do is to move the big toe on your right foot. That would be your act of faith. You're walking and moving that toe. That's all I can do, but that's my act of faith. Are you following me? So whatever else it might be that you're believing God for, First of all, a confession, then followed by an action. Faith is acting. It's not passive. It's always active. If you're not active, first, first of all, on your confession, then followed by a physical action, then you're not in faith. And it won't work for you. It won't produce. Now, we left off with Mark eleven twenty four last night. And uh, I wanted to emphasize it because Mark eleven twenty four is an example of what's called petition prayer or literally the prayer of faith. I have found, and we have it, I have it out in my new book called Answered Prayer Guaranteed. I have found, and because I'm not perfect, I may have missed some, but I found at least six different methods of prayer. And each method is circumscribed by its own set of rules. Prayer is not just prayer is prayer is prayer is prayer is what some Christians say or think. And you hear people say, well, just pray. Well, pray what? You know, you, you need to know what you're doing. All of the things of God, they are precise and precision. And it's not just haphazard. And so you, you have to know what kind of prayer you're praying. There are different kinds of prayer. They're all circumscribed by a different set of rules. I like to use the illustration of sports. Basketball, baseball, football, soccer are all classified under the heading of sports. But you can't successfully and legally play baseball with basketball rules. You'll be called out on a technicality, yet you're still playing a sport. Well, prayer is the same way. This prayer is the most common prayer, Mark eleven twenty four, 24, that a Christian would pray. It's the most common, as it were, daily prayer that you would pray, the prayer of faith and or petition prayer. There's a prayer of consecration and dedication. That's the one that Jesus prayed in the garden. That's the only time you'd ever use an if it be thy will. If you use an if it be thy will on a petition prayer, you'll cancel the prayer. If you say to God, Lord, I'm sick, I need to be healed, I, uh, I, if it be your will, heal me, you've just signed your own death certificate. You're on your way to the cemetery or certainly in intensive care because, see, you're violating the word of God. See, the word of God, see, see, prayer of faith and prayer have to be based on the known will of God. That's why Satan has cleverly kept the word of God out of most churches. So most Christians don't know the word, they don't know their covenant, so they operate on instinct and or emotions. And God doesn't respond to that. He only responds to his word. But when you know the word, then you'll know that the word says in Matthew 8, 17, for instance, that himself, Jesus, took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Took and bore our past tense designations, indicative of the fact that the time of the action has already taken place. Not taking place, a done deal. <laughs> Common street talk, done deal. He took and bore. Then 1 Peter 2, 24 says, and with his stripes, referring to Jesus the Christ, with his stripes, you were healed. Not you are being healed, present tense. Not you will be healed in the future. Ye were. And if ye were, then ye are. And if ye are, then ye is. And Hebrews 11, 1 says, now faith is, present tense. Okay? So if you ask God to heal you, you have just said he hadn't done it. He said he has. You don't agree. It can't work. Are you following me? So the prayer of faith is Mark eleven twenty four 24, petition prayer. That's the prayer, just you and God. And a lot of Christians, because they don't understand that, they're always praying prayers like that for other people, and then the person ends up dying. Then they'll say, well, see, that faith stuff doesn't work. It's not God's will for everybody to be healed. Because, see, they knew their sincerity, but they were praying the wrong prayer, but they didn't know it because their church didn't tell them that. So out of their sincerity, the only conclusion can be, I couldn't be wrong, so it must not be God's will. Seems reasonable, doesn't it? See? And so they try to pray the prayer of faith. You can't pray the prayer of faith for someone else. 
You can stand in agreement with them, or you can get into another kind of prayer, the prayer of agreement, Matthew 18, 19. If two of you shall agree on earth is touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them. Plural. If two of you, and it could be more, but if two of you agree on earth is touching anything that they, the two of them, shall ask, it shall be done for them, the two. So they, gotta, they have to, you got to be on the same road. You can't be believing to go south and I'm believing to go north and it work. It won't work. And sometimes you're praying for people and they don't want to be healed. Good, ex, good illustration is my wife's mother. She was stricken with arthritis, terrible arthritis for, for years, what, 20 some years. And, uh, but she, well, she was a gracious lady, just awesome, lovable person. She'd give her the last stitch of clothes off her back for somebody else. And she had helped people over the years, and, and she was a very hard worker. She worked. They had, what, 12 kids? 12 kids, and so a big family. It came from Mississippi, gravitated up to, to, to California, and so they had to work. Husband and wife both had to work just to put a roof over their heads, you know what I mean? And she worked. She was a cook, a chef, and so she cooked and she worked. And she got stricken with this condition, and uh, then she had to be, finally became bedridden. And all these people over the years that she had helped, Man, they came like bees to the honeycomb. They came to help her to do, clean her house, cook her food. Shoot, mama said, what's with this? I've been working all these years and burning the skillets and the pots and thing. I'm going to sit back and enjoy this. Folk were bringing her bonbons and cleaning her house. She didn't want to get well because if she got well, she'd have to go back to work. <laughs> now, see, that sounds strange, but you don't always know the motivation of people. See, so sometimes when things don't work, it's because they, they don't want to be healed. If they get healed, they got to go back to work, and they kind of like all this attention they've been getting. You know what I'm saying? So you have to be careful. You can't pray the prayer of faith for someone else. Now, if you have an infant child or a very small child that can't believe for themselves, you're the parent, then you can exercise your faith on their behalf. But when you get up to the point where you're at the age where you know right from wrong, you're going to have to use your own faith. Now, I can help you when I say me. We can help one another if it's a baby Christian and they really don't know the route, as it were. We can get into agreement with them. But you can't just indiscriminately pray, well, I believe so-and-so is healed, or I believe so-and-so got a new job. Or I... No, no, no. You can only agree with them. The prayer of faith and the prayer of, uh, of um, petition prayer is for you and God. Look at the scripture, Mark eleven twenty four. 24. Jesus said, what things soever you desire... I'm reading from the traditional King James. What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe, you receive them, and you shall have them. Notice what it does not say. It does not say what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe he receives it, and she'll get it. <laughs> no, it doesn't say that. It says what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe, you receive them, and you shall have them. Not your wife, not your cousin, your aunt, uncle, dog, hog, or frog, only you. And you got to be careful when you pray that. Now watch it. He says, what things whoever you desire, when you pray, when you pray, when you pray. Remember Hebrews 11.1, 1, we talked about that. Now faith is, when is faith? Now faith is, I told you the most important thing that you can find out about faith is it's always present tense, it's always now. And so Jesus said, when you pray, so when would when you pray be? It would be now. If I pray in November on Thanksgiving Day, just before we destroy the bird and thank the Lord for all of his bountiful goodness, when we pray, when I pray before we cut up the bird, it will be now when I pray. December 25th, the day that we basically agreed to celebrate the birthday of our Lord Jesus Christ before we open up all the presents that God has provided us with, all the good things. When I pray and thank the Lord for that, when I pray on December 25th, it will be now when I pray. I don't understand that. What's he talking about now? He might be crazy. It's going to be December 25th. It's not going to be now. They miss it. Meaning, whenever, it's always going to be present tense. And that's what you have to understand. When you pray, not after you pray, not when you feel something, not when you see something, but when you pray, believe. Believe what? 
believe God is. Ah, yes, I believe that God is. Well, you ought to believe that, but not when you're praying about your desire. Well, things wherever you desire when you pray, believe. Ah, yes, believe that Jesus is coming again. Yes, I believe that the Lord is coming. That's great, and you ought to believe that, but not when you're praying about your desire. It says, when you pray, believe that you receive them. What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them. When you pray, believe that you receive them. When you pray, believe that you receive them. When you pray, believe. Not feel like you receive them. Not see them. Just believe it. Well, how can I believe I got something when I can't see it? Well, I have a question for you. Do you have a brain? When is the last time you've seen it? <laughs> See, somebody told you you had a brain. It might be something else up there. And actually, based on the way you've been acting, <clears throat> it's doubtful as anything in there. <laughs> Are you following me? So what are you talking about? We do it all the time. Talking about, I can't believe I got something I can't see. Yes, you do. You believe you got a job? Do you believe you're going to get paid next week? Or you may be at the end of this week on Friday. You haven't seen the money, have you? Have you? Well, how do you know you're going to get paid? Well, they said they were going to pay. Well, Jesus said, when you pray, believe you receive and you shall have. Why can't you take him at his word? You believe some stranger and you can't believe your Lord. He said, what things whoever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them when you pray. Believe that you receive them and you shall have. Notice that when you pray is present tense now, shall have is future tense. Future to the now. It could be future one second, one minute, one day, one hour, one year. Could be future. But you got to believe. I made a claim one time some years back. It took 13 years for it to manifest. I said, someone is going to give me $1 million. Not to the church, not to the ministry, but to Fred, personally. $1 million. Now, I use this as an illustration because sometimes when we pray about things, we're not taking everything into consideration. Everything that we pray about is already in this earth realm. Most of it's in the hands of someone else. That's why we are praying about it because we don't have it. And it has to come through human channels. God doesn't drop money out of the sky. God can't create money out of nothing because he would be arrested as a counterfeiter. And I didn't say that to be funny. If you think I'm joking, you try to print you some money and see what happens to you. They'll catch you at it. You're going to jail. You're a counterfeiter. All the money's already been authorized by the United States Treasury. Anything else that's put into circulation would be out of sequence. The numbers wouldn't add up. So God can't just indiscriminately drop money out of the sky. He has to speak to somebody to go give somebody or do something for someone. He uses human instrumentality. So number one, I, that's a big thing, a million dollars. Everybody's not walking around with a million bucks in their pocket. So when I made that claim, God, number one, had to find someone that had disposable income of a million dollars that could afford to give it away and it not hurt their lifestyle. <laughs> and then the most important thing of all, God had to find somebody that was listening to him. <laughs> Because the average person would say, I rebuke you, devil. Come out in Jesus' name. That can't be God. Million dollars. I rebuke that. All six of you demons, come out now. <laughs> you know I'm telling the truth. Because some of you are having a hard time tithing, giving 10%. You know if God told you to give a million dollars, you're going to really. I, I, I'm going to move on. I'm not going to say. I'm not, I'm not even going to finish that statement. But so somebody had to have the million dollars. So finally God found someone who had the right heart, believed the word, and had the million dollars, so that's why it took that long. And so I had to make my confession and stand up. One day he came, gave me $1 million, certified check for $1 million bucks. Then when he found out what I wanted it for, he ascertained, what, you know, why, why would you want a million dollars? Well, we had our, the house that we live in now, we wanted to pay it off uh, way before the 30-year mortgage. And it's a big house, it costs a lot of money, so it took a little bit longer than the previous house. We paid the previous house off um, in uh, three and a half years. But this one took a little bit longer. And so I told him I wanted to pay it off. And I had been making some principal reduction payments, $100,000 at a shot. And the house, I got it down to 900 and 
$98,000 is all I owed on it. And so I told him, that's what I wanted to pay it with. Then I told him, I said, if I get the million dollars, then I'm going to have to pay my tithes out of that. I think at that time we were tithing 30%. 35? Or we were tithing 35%. So I'd have to take 35% right off the top. Then, because of the tax bracket I'm in, I'd have to give away 53% in taxes. So I wouldn't end up with the $998,000. So he was, this person was so gracious, he paid the tithes and the taxes so that I would come out with the $100,000 clear and free. And as soon as I got it, I made it to the mortgage folk and said, give me the title deed on my property. <laughs> Paid that sucker off. And then immediately boosted our ties up to 40%. So my point is, you have to be careful when you're praying about things because other people are involved, particularly if it's about money. It has to come through other people's hands. Now, that could come through overtime, opportunity that nobody else gets. Could be a raise, could be a promotion. It, it, you don't know how it's going to come. <laughs> and frankly, I don't give a care as long as it comes. Do I have a witness? <laughs> That's right. Yes, so I, you can put the money in a brown paper bag, put it in a collie dog's mouth, and let him trot down the street and bring it to me. I ain't mad. I'm not mad. You understand that? Okay. Now, so he said, what things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. So your confession is, I believe that I have received. Don't say I'm healed because if you were healed, you wouldn't have to believe it. So if the manifestation hasn't come yet, then you're still, it's a faith confession, not a fact confession. But it's the faith confessions that produce the fact confessions. So you have the faith fact, then the physical fact. So your confession is, I believe that I am healed. Now, see, God said you're healed, but you have to believe that. So your confession, until it physically manifests, is, I believe you, Lord. So therefore, I believe that I am healed. I believe that my need is met. I believe that I have the property I've claimed. I believe I have the job. I, we, I believe we have a child. Whatever it might be, it's, I believe, until such time as it physically manifests. Once it does, then you can say, thank you, Father, I have it. That's the end of the transaction. Let me give you an illustration really quickly. Let's say you wake up on Monday morning, and you have this huge knot on your left forearm. It's painful. It's red. It's purplish color. It just wasn't there Sunday night when you went to bed. But this thing is ugly and hurts like the blazes. So you say, I know this is not God, and I know I don't need to keep this. So you lay hands on yourself and say, I curse this thing in the name of Jesus. I believe I received my healing based on Mark eleven twenty four, 24, Matthew 8, 17, and 1 Peter 2, 24. So I believe that I am healed. Father, thank you. I believe that I am healed. I wake up Tuesday morning. Thing is still there. Hurts just like it did on Monday. I wake up Wednesday morning, same thing. Thursday morning, Friday morning. Every single day I say, Father, I thank you. I believe that I am healed. You have to keep it in the present tense. So Friday, same thing. Saturday, same thing. Sunday, same thing. I wake up Monday morning, everything's gone. Look, just like normal flesh like I've always had. At that time, my prayer is, Father, I thank you. I am healed. How do you know? <laughs> Look at my arm. I got the proof. Got the evidence. Before that, I believe I am. How can you believe that? Look at the word. The word is my evidence. Himself took my infirmities, bore my sickness with the stripes. I am healed. Do you understand that? Now, that same, that formula works for everything in reference to just you and God. We're talking about the prayer of faith. Now, you might ask, well, why does Jesus say when you pray, which is now? That, that's a good question. It's extremely important. I had to come to realize why, because you, you would say, well, why can't he just do it now? Why can't it just, you know, I can, I can handle this now. We don't have to wait. <laughs> so why does he say now? Well, the reason for this is, and listen carefully, the reason that you have to believe you receive when you pray is because if you don't believe you receive when you pray, God cannot hear you tomorrow. Uh, what did he say? <laughs> okay, listen carefully. This is not, this is not funny. It's, it's, it's a truism. You've got to understand it. God can only hear you pray now. He cannot hear you pray tomorrow because he doesn't have a tomorrow in which to hear you. God lives in one eternal now. There is no tomorrow with God. There is no yesterday with God. There is only now with God. 
because he has, now we can't, we can't disprove it, so we might as well go with the flow until we get better information. I, I don't know how, but based on the Bible, God has always been and will always be. How, I don't know, but I can't refute it. Therefore, I might as well go with it until some other information comes along. So God lives in one eternal now. He doesn't have a tomorrow, and he doesn't have a yesterday. We do because we're creatures circumscribed by time. Time is important to us. It's of the essence because every single moment that we breathe, we are getting closer to our point of departure and further away from our point of origin. Every day you live, you're not getting more life. You're using up life. Every day you live, you're getting closer to the cemetery, not further from it. But since God has no beginning and has no end, then therefore God doesn't have any clocks in heaven and he doesn't have any calendars and he never celebrates anniversaries or birthdays. We do because time is important to us. Everything we do is relative to time, not to God. There is no time with him. So that's why Jesus said, when you pray, believe you receive, because that's the only time God's going to be able to hear it. You understand that? It's very important. When you pray, believe you receive, because that's the only time God can hear it. God lives in one eternal now. Everything with God is now. How? I don't know. When you find out, clue me in. Send me an email. But, but it, it is, and, and I can prove it because everything about God is always in the now. Do you remember or are you familiar with the story when Moses was watching Jethro's sheep? And he saw something strange over there near the mountain, and it was bright and flickering. So he said, I'll go over and investigate. When he got there, he saw a bush that seemed to be literally on fire but was not consumed. And then he heard a voice saying, take your shoes off. The ground on which you stand is holy ground. He was amazed. And then the voice came and said, I've heard the cry of my people in Israel, in Egypt, and I've come down to send you to let them go, to deliver them. And Moses thought he could get out of it, the assignment, so he tried to remonstrate with God and said, well, blah, 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 I, 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 I st stutter. So, he said, that's all right. Don't worry about it. I'll send Aaron with you. He'll be your mouthpiece. Then he tried to come up with another one and said, well, wait a minute. Some years back, you know, I had to leave Egypt, and my driver's license has been revoked. My <laughs> Social Security card is no longer valid. He said, what am I going to do? What am I going to tell Pharaoh? And what did God say to him? This, a lot of people pick up on this, but they miss the whole thing. God said to Moses, he said, you tell Pharaoh that I am that I am has sent you. Now, what kind of name is that? <laughs> Hello, I am. I hope to be, but you am. <laughs> Seriously, he said, you he said, tell him, I am that I am has sent you. What tense is I am now? God didn't say, you go tell Pharaoh I was has sent you. You don't go tell Pharaoh I will be someday. You tell Pharaoh I am that I am. And when his son Jesus the Christ came on the scene, he picked up on his father's M.O. and began to say the very same kinds of things. I am he that liveth and was dead. I am the first and the last. I am the alpha and the omega. I am he that was dead, but behold, I'm alive forevermore. I am the shepherd of the sheep. I am the door of the sheep. I am, I am, I am, present tense. Same thing that his father said. So when we pray, we've got to believe that we receive it right now because that's the only time that God can hear us. He's a present tense God. Now, we need to make and understand that we need to make our confession, and it needs to be verbal. You don't have to say it to people because they won't understand. They think you're crazy. You know, that's their problem, but, you, you know, you don't want to say things where people are going to come against you. So, but you have to say it out loud, at least loud enough for your ears to hear it. And, you know, we looked at the scripture in Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And notice what that verse doesn't say. It does not say who you have to hear it from. You can hear it from your own mouth. I believe that one reason that many Christians have a real problem with this in, in faith coming is because they know their word is no good. <laughs> it's worthless. 
So that's why they don't want to say anything, because they know their word's not any good. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You have to say it with confidence in your own word. And confidence in your word is a choice. It's not genetically transmitted. It's not in the DNA, just a choice you make. I have made a choice years ago to make my word good. But I would rather die than break my word. Because actually, that's all you have is your word. You are no better than your word. Amen. I alluded to that, I think, earlier. If I can't count on your word, that means I can't count on you. You are only as good as your word. That's why God himself says in his word that he has magnified his name over all, his word over all his name. Because God is only as good as his word. And most people's word, worthless, no good. They say stuff and they don't do it. They don't follow through. So there's no point in saying anything because they know it's not going to come to pass because they don't believe it themselves. So you have to believe in your words. You have to believe in your word. Now, so you want to you continuously say it. Every time in your prayer time, you say, Father, thank you, I believe I've received whatever it is, particular item you may have asked for. Now, the reason you have to keep saying it and using your words is because you're in a warfare. You're in a spiritual battle. You have an enemy. He doesn't want you to succeed, and he doesn't want you to obtain anything that God has said belongs to you in his word. So I want to show you a scripture that will just emphasize this so clearly. Go in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 10. This is so important, how, how important your words are. He said, when you pray, believe you receive, and you'll have. So you have to say, I believe I have received. I believe my need is met. Now, another thing that you have to be aware of, that, that faith is progressive. The beautiful thing is, according to Romans 12 and 3, we all start out with the same measure of faith. And this is the good news. Nobody, but nobody, has any more faith than you do. It appears sometimes that some people do because they have perhaps learned how to develop it and have used it, and like anything, use produces growth or development where non-use produces atrophy or wasting away. But that's the beautiful thing about it. I was so glad when I found that out that I wasn't at a disadvantage in the things of God, but everyone is on par. You have, you'd have to be, because if I have more faith than you do, then that means the Bible has been invalidated, because the Bible says that God is no respecter of persons. So if he gives me more than he gives you, he definitely is a respecter of persons, and he is not a respecter of persons. And it's interesting, sometimes this is a danger, I've been on television since 1978 so I've been on a long time and and people think that because you're on television you know what you're talking about <laughs> but like the old song says it ain't necessarily so because I hear a whole lot of stuff on TV and I just go click and change channel I can't I can't listen to that it may be for somebody may throw in for free and so I've had people write me letters. I remember I even had a lady, I think she came from Ohio, all the way out to Los Angeles for me to pray for her. Now, my ego would like to think I'm somebody special, but I'm not a fool. I know whatever I may be, I am that because of God. I'd like to think I'd be the man. You know, come on, we all want to be, you know. I'd rather be important than less important, you know. But I got better. I know better than that. It's the anointing, not me. God uses yielded vessels. All I've done is attempt to yield. And this lady came all the way out to California for me to pray for her. She had arthritis for years and years and years. I don't know, 25 years she had arthritis. And as I mentioned last night, and I'll be praying for uh, ministering to the sick tomorrow night to those that have arthritis, bursitis, and rheumatism. And a lady came up in the line, and, and, and I laid hands on her, and instantaneously she was healed. 25 years of pain and all the rest of the stuff, gone, just like that. But she didn't have to come 
from Ohio to California because I didn't do the healing. It was the power of God. Amen. See what I mean? But because she thought I had all this faith because I teach on it and because I'm on television, oh, this is God's great man of faith and power. Well, you know, I'd like to think I'd be the man. But I know that's not true. Everybody has the same measure of faith. You start out with the same measure. Now you're going to have to develop it. Romans 12, 3, God has dealt to each one of us the measure of faith. So what you have to do is you should be growing in your faith. And you should use some methodology to determine that you're growing. Are you following me? See, if I, if I want to go from, from Fort Worth to Dallas, I would push the little button on my odometer, tripometer, I should say, back to zero. And at any given time, I can tell how far I've traveled. And how far, knowing how far mileage-wise Dallas is from Fort Worth, I can determine how much further I have to go. I can check myself out. When we were kids, in the summertime where we lived, it was, we used to have alleys behind the houses, and a lot of people had these board fences up. And so we would stand each kid up and take a little straight thing and put it up against his head and then on the wall and draw a line and put his name on there. And then next summer we would come back and take the same kid, stand at the same line, and you could see the difference between the year that had passed that there was growth. So you need to have some way to measure the fact that you're growing in faith because faith can be at a greater or lesser degree of manifestation at any given time. Faith is not just faith is faith is faith. It is something that can be developed. You ought to know this from, the, I'll give you two scriptures real quick, not the scriptures, but the two illustrations. One time Jesus, you're probably familiar with this, one time Jesus was walking down the road and an entourage came to him and said that the centurion has sent us, he has a servant at home that's sick. He wants you to come and heal him. Jesus started on the way and then the centurion sent a delegation back to him and said, it's not, need, not, not needful for you to physically come to my house. Just speak the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus turned to the crowd and said, I have not found such great faith. No, not in Israel. That word great is a descriptive term. It describes a degree, a quantity, an amount, or a condition. When you hear great, you don't think of minuscule or minute. You think of something humongous and big, right? Then another time, Jesus had been up on the mountain praying. The disciples were on the Sea of Galilee. A storm arose. They were being whipped by the wave. Jesus went to them walking on the water, got near the boat, and said, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. <laughs> Peter said, If it be you. Jesus just got through saying, It is I. And Peter said, if it be you. <laughs> See, that's the way we do it. And we don't even think about it when we're saying it. We don't even realize what we just said. He said, be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Peter said, if it be you, <laughs> let me come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. The Bible says Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water. But when he saw the wind, when he looked at the circumstances, instead of at the word of God, he began to sink. Jesus caught him and said, oh, you of little faith. Now, don't tell me there's not a difference between little and great. So faith can be at different levels. So it's not just faith is faith is faith. Where are you? Where are you? Do you even know where you are in terms of your development of faith? Well, one of the ways you can test it, I like to use this because it's something people can see and relate to. What can you, now listen carefully, this is one way that you can test. It doesn't mean you're better than anyone else or less than. It just means now I have a point of reference. I can determine where I am and whether I am actually growing. You can keep hearing and not grow. It's not automatic. So I'm going to ask you a question. Think about this. This, will, this can help you. Now, you have to be careful because the mind is a tricky thing, and what you will do is you will hear what I didn't say because it, it almost sounds like a trick statement, but it's not. It's designed to help you locate yourself. Ask yourself the question, what can you believe God for? I believe the Lord can do anything. I didn't ask you that. That goes without saying. I ask you, what can you believe God 
four. Can you believe him for a tricycle? Can you believe him for an SUV? Or can you believe him for a Bentley Arnage at $300,000? See, what can you believe God for? Are you following me? And so you can measure yourself. You can use your giving as a measuring rod. Again, it doesn't make you better than or less than, but it's something, it's tangible. You can see it. You know what's going out of your pocket. It's easy to track that and, 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 and tell where you are. So what can you believe God for? Way back, my wife and I started, as I think I mentioned earlier in the other service, about tithing. And, and we started out with the traditional tithe, which means 10% or a tenth. And it took all, all of the faith that she and I could put together. It took every ounce of that faith and with literal fear and trepidation because we weren't making it on 100% that we received as an income. Now, how can we take 10% of it and make it on the 90%? But I saw that it was God's way. I saw that the reason I was having all these problems was because I was robbing God and I was operating in the curse and I didn't realize I was because my church didn't tell me that I was. They just said, hold on to God's unchanging hand. <laughs> and, and that wouldn't have been so bad if I could have found his hand. I thought, where, hey, where's the hand? You know, just cliches, don't do anything. And so we decided we were going to tithe and do it God's way because what we were doing definitely wasn't working. So we had nowhere to go but up because we was already down as far as you could get. So with nothing, we couldn't lose anything. We could only gain. So we started at 10%. Now, again, it doesn't make you better than or more spiritual. It just means you have made a commitment, and now you can tell where you are. It took all of our faith to believe God to give away 10% and make it on the 90% that was left. As of today, tonight, we give away 40% of all of our money and live better on the 60% than we did on the 90% when we first started out. Now, it took time to develop that. We didn't start out with 40%, but step by step by step. So it's easier for me to believe that I can give away 40% of all my money, all of my income, and live as good on the 60% that's left over as I could if I had kept the whole 100%. I couldn't do that when we started. I told you it was with fear and shaking and trepidation that we gave up to 10%. But over time, so that's one area that's very observable. It's, 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 it's physical. You can relate to that. What can you believe God for. See, again, it's not to put you down or to make you think you're less than or better. It's just an idea. That's something that's very easy to track. Your money, honey. Very easy to track. I'm not doing any credits. I didn't tell you that for some kind of, ooh, ooh, ooh. no, 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 no. It's just showing you what you can do if you dare to believe God's word. And we believe, we, we receive more giving away 40% than we did when we was only giving away 10%. Because it goes on. The beat goes on and on and on. So where are you? Do you even know where you are? What can you believe God for? Listen, if you can't believe God to get rid of a headache, don't mess around when that doctor tells you you got a lump. Go get that thing fixed. Because, brother, sister, if you didn't have the faith to keep it from coming, how are you going to get rid of it with your faith? Amen. Satan will take you out. Okay, so that's how you want to do five. Where are you in reference to your faith? If you can't believe for 10 percent, how are you going to believe for 40 percent? See what I mean? Just it's just a, a place where you can gauge yourself. It doesn't make you better than or more spiritual than. It's just a matter of a commitment, a matter of a choice. That's all. But that's one area. There are other areas probably. But that one is so real because that every one of us can relate to money because that's the only reason you're working on your job. That's the only reason you're going to get up tomorrow and go to your job is because of the money. If your company, unless you're in business for yourself, but if your company, if you're working for somebody else and your company told you tomorrow, we, can't, we, ain't, we don't have any more money, but we want you to keep on working. We can't pay you anyway. Shoot. I'm out of there. <laughs> Swoop, shake the dust off. I'm out of there. You know I'm telling the truth. You're not going to stay there and work. You're working for one reason only, the money. And you want more of it. Because uh, if you liked your job so much, you'd work for free and tell them you give that money to somebody else. I just love my job. I don't think so. 
So you have to know where you are before you start laying claim to your desire. See, you can have a desire for a Bentley and don't have Volkswagen faith in manifestation. I mean, there'd, there'd be a little difference between a Volkswagen and a Bentley. Not a lot, but a little difference. Mm. So you don't want to try to, you don't want to try to, to, to believe for too much, even though you may have a desire for it. Put that desire off to the future until your faith can match it. I don't know if anybody here works out in a gymnasium or has worked out in a gymnasium or even pumps a little iron or something for, 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 for exercise purposes. Well, if you've never lifted any weights at all and you go into the gymnasium and load the bar up and you're going to do a bench press with 500 pounds, we're going to have your funeral. <laughs> Ain't no way you're going to pump 500 pounds. You've never even been in a gym before. Your muscles can't handle it. But if you go out there and start with 10 pounds, and keep on working on that long enough, you can get to the point where you can pump 500 pounds. Men do it. But they didn't start out with that. So you don't want to start out with 500 pound faith objective and then rupture yourself or kill yourself and become discouraged because it didn't work. Your muscle or your faith muscle is not up to par yet. Work on the little things and gradually work up to the bigger things to where your faith can handle it. Are you, are you following? Does it make any sense to you? You get that? Did I tell you to turn to Daniel? Chapter 10, yeah. Did I tell you, you, thought I, you thought I forgot, I didn't forget. Okay, watch this. Now, we're talking about Jesus said, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. I said you've got a, the basic ways that you exercise your faith. Number one, you start out with the confession, and then you follow it up with whatever action is appropriate and available to you that supports that confession that's based on God's word. Faith has to be based on the known will of God. You don't just... Grab it out there in the middle of nowhere. Because God only responds to his word. Now, I said Daniel, but let, let me give, keep your finger on Daniel. Go to Mark's gospel, the 16th chapter, and let me give you a confirmation of what I just said. Because some people, they think they can just come off the wall with anything and it's going to work. See, when Jesus said what things whatever you desire, you have to understand the whole modus operandi that God operates by. It's not just anything you can desire that's going to happen. I'll guarantee you, I'll guarantee you, you can't just say, well, I believe I'm going to be a pilot and I'm going to fly for British Airways. And it's my desire to fly a 747-400 jet. So I'm going to go over to British Airways and put in an application. You can't even drive a car. <laughs> you think you, God's going to let you behind the, the yoke of that airplane? Not so. Not so. So the desire has to be consistent with what the covenant tells you. And in studying the covenant, I have found that it covers everything. Say everything. 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 I think I said this before, but it'll bear repetition. It covers everything that you will ever need and any and everything you could ever desire that is consistent with a godly life. Notice how I qualified that. Okay, I can't say, ooh, I like her, she looks good, I want to go to bed with her, and then I think I have her, and I think I, oh, oh, I really like that one over there. That ain't going to work, that's not a godly life, that won't work. Are you following me? But people do have some strange desires, you know I'm telling the truth. <laughs> Amen. All right, what did I say, Mark? Yeah, I wanted to show you this, Mark chapter 16, if you have it, say I have it. Verse 20, it said, and they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming them with the word through the accompanying signs, or as the tradition says, signs followed. Listen to it again. And they went out, this is the apostles after Jesus went back to heaven. They went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming them with the word. No? How dare you say no? No, it doesn't say that, does it? It says, working with them and confirming the word with signs following. The signs don't come until after the word. God does not confirm males or females, black, white, brown, red, yellows. He doesn't confirm Methodist or Baptist or Catholic, and no offense, please don't take offense, but he doesn't confirm denominations. He doesn't confirm theology. He doesn't confirm geographical location. He only confirms his word with signs following. The signs come after the word. No word, no signs. Comprende? No word, 
No sign. God doesn't confirm you. He doesn't confirm me. He confirms his word. <laughs> so if I don't give him his word, he doesn't have anything to confirm. You can't just go off on a tangent and just say, rah, rah, rah. no, it's got to be in line with the word. And then you're assured of a successful conclusion to the illustration. All right, back to Daniel, chapter number 10. If you have it, say, I have it. Now, I want to show you about the words. Remember I told you the first thing is confession of your mouth, then followed by whatever physical action you can come up with that's consistent with your confession. Because, see, he said, what things wherever you desire, when you pray, believe you receive it, and you shall have it. Well, if you've prayed and you believe you receive it, then why can't you say it? Why wouldn't you say it? And then some Christians, bless their little hearts, because they don't know, they'll say, well, I, I have it in my heart. The, the Lord knows that I have it in my heart. I don't always say anything, and I don't always talk, but, but God knows that I have it in my heart. That's right, and God knows you're the biggest liar in town. You know why? Because the word says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if the mouth is not speaking, must not be anything in there. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. <clears throat> so if the mouth is not speaking, apparently, to use my best grammar, ain't nothing in there. I hope you got that. You have to say it. You have to talk it. All right. Now, Daniel, <clears throat> um, let me give you a little scenario. Daniel had had a vision. He didn't understand the vision. So he prayed as it were and asked God for the vision. God sent him an answer. Daniel chapter 10, verse 10. Suddenly a hand touched me. This is Daniel speaking. Suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hand. And he said to me, O oh, Daniel, man greatly beloved, Understand the word that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Now watch this. Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day, say first day, for from, this is, this is 21 days later that this event occurred with this angel, but, but the angel said, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. Watch this now. And I have come because of your words. He didn't say I have come because of you. I have come because of your words. That's why your words are important. That's why you have to speak it. He didn't say I've come because of you. I have come because of your words. Don't tell me that's not important. Then watch this, verse 13. But, let me read verse 12 again. Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. He's talking about a demon spirit that was over the kingdom of Persia. And these demon spirits are working in the spirit realm to thwart the answer to your prayer. That's why you have to stand and having done all to stand. That's why you have to continue to make that confession. 21 days Daniel spoke and the angel said, I have come because of your words. Your words are what allowed me to get through and pass through the demonic forces that we're trying to hinder. See, you're in a warfare, and Satan doesn't want you to obtain the desires of your heart. He doesn't want you to get to a position where you become a threat to his uh, continue to rule over you. When you break out of his bonds and walk in the fullness of your covenant benefits, he doesn't like that. But guess what? Who gives a care what he likes? Okay? But you got to fight the good fight of faith, and that's where it means to stand. So your confession, you can make that confession. I don't care how long it takes. I told you, 13 years, I kept saying, somebody's going to give me a million dollars. I just kept saying it, just kept saying it, kept saying it. Here, here's my philosophy. Guess what? This, this is the way I look at stuff. I'm, I'm a real simple person. This is what I look at. Let's say I said it, and it didn't work. 
So what? I'm no worse off than I was before. I had nothing when I started. If I don't get nothing at the end, then nothing from nothing is nothing. I don't know if you know it, but zero minus zero is zero, and zero plus zero is zero, and zero divided by zero is zero, and zero times zero is zero. You got nothing to lose. Go for it. If it doesn't work, you've lost nothing. But oh, if it does work, and it does, woo, glory to God, you are ahead of the game, brother, sister. Go for it. Go for the gold. Don't settle for the bronze. He said, I've come because of your words. God hears your words. And when those words agree with his word, you have a connection. And God will pass over 27 million people to get to one man or one woman that will dare to take him at his word. God is not impressed with your designer clothes. God is not impressed with your alligator shoes. God is not impressed with your big fancy house with your flat screen TVs in every room. Nothing wrong with that. God responds to his word through your mouth. Learn to speak God speak. And then you'll have his power in manifestation. Hallelujah. You still here? I like that. I like that. And see, oh boy. Mm -hmm. All right, let me see. Where am I going to go now? Now, I, I think I've, I've covered what faith is. We found out there's a difference between faith and belief. I would like to, to spend the rest of our time together tonight talking about what faith is not. Because as I've had the privilege to travel all over the world and and, and particularly zeroing in on this particular subject, as I, as I told you, that's, this is my assignment outside of my pastorate. This is one of the areas where God uh, has anointed me to, uh, to teach. Again, not that I know everything, but that's just the anointing. And uh, I've seen it as I've gone in different countries, different continents, and I found people are people are people are people because they have to deal with the same devil. I mean, there's no Chinese devil over in China. And there's no Russian devil in Russia. And there's no South American devil in Brazil. And it's the same old, same old, same old, same old. And uh, in, in, in dealing with people, you pick up on some things. And one of the things I've noticed is that a lot of people, somehow they've got the wrong slant on some things. And there are certain things that they think are faith because they've heard people say it but they've never seen it in the Word. So just so that you could be armed with this, you may already know it, but you'll be able to help other people, uh, and it, it may confirm some things that you know. So I want to just talk a little bit about some things that, that faith is not. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Many times it's just as good to know what a thing is not as to know what it is. Because I know at first, when I first was introduced to the principles, the law of faith, there were some things that, 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 that I heard, you know, in the church world. And sometimes because we have confidence in people, which is not wrong in and of itself, but sometimes we have to be very careful. And it's an awesome thing to stand in a position of ministry. Personally, I don't take it lightly. <laughs> Because one of these days I'm going to have to give an account of my stewardship of what the Lord has told me. And it's, it's, a, it's an awesome thing because somebody is going to believe that what you say is true. And that's a, that's a horrendous situation if you're telling people the wrong thing. So I do the best I can to be sure that I'm sure that what I'm saying is truth and can be validated by the word. It's not truth because I say it in a clever way that sounds reasonable. <laughs> and that's not the name of the game. It better be you should be able to find it. Even if you can't find the fully developed plant in the Word, you should find the seeds. Because everything in the Word is not fully developed. It's seeds. And they have to be planted in your heart, watered with the confession of your mouth, and then they grow and develop. 
And so we have to be careful. We want to talk about what faith is not. Second um, Corinthians chapter 4, if you have it, say I have it. Verse 18. It says, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, if you will remember Hebrews 11, 1, it talked about now faith is the substance of things, T-H-I-N-G-S, things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Remember that? And I gave you an alternate rending, rendering of that word seen instead of saying seen because it limits us to visual perception. And when you do that, then you miss everything you could hear, everything you could smell, everything you could taste, and everything you could touch because that's how we relate to the physical three-dimensional world that we live in. It's through our physical senses that are located in our body. And so just to say, to use the word seen, it, 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 it conveys the idea of visual perception, but then you miss all those other things. So I gave you an alternate rendering, which I really believe is what the Spirit of God was conveying. But again, the writers of the Bible, they, they put things many times in the context of what they know, or at least what they think they know. And so we can miss it. So I want to use that, that alternate I gave you. Instead of saying seen, perceived by the senses. Because that's bottom line. That's what's going to happen. It's going to be what we perceive by our senses. So I want to read verse 18 that way. While we do not look at the things which are perceived by the senses, but at the things which are not perceived by the senses, for or because the things which are perceived by the senses are temporary, temporal, or subject to change, but the things which are not perceived by the senses are eternal. Can you buy into that? Okay. Now, some Christians have said, Teachers have said, or let, let me say it this way, they've left the impression that to walk by faith means you deny what the senses are telling you. In other words, you deny that sickness is there. You deny that poverty is there. They're, they're thinking that to walk by faith means you deny what's in the sense realm. But that's not true. It's not true. The word, we just read it. If You, you, you might have missed it, but what well, we just read proves what I just said. Watch this. It says, while we do not look at the things which are seen or perceived by the senses... The very fact that Paul says we do not look at them means that them exist. Because if them did not exist, you couldn't look at them anyway, so there would be no need for him to tell you not to look at something that's not there. You get that? See, he says, while well, we do not look at the things which are seen. So the things which are seen must be there. He's not telling us to deny that they're there. He simply says, don't look at them. Well, Brother Price, if I don't look at the things which are seen, what am I supposed to do about the things which are seen? Ignore them. Don't deny them. Ignore them. But how do I do that? The same way you ignore me when you don't want to be bothered with me. You act like I'm not there, stick your little pointed nose up in the sky and walk right by me just like I don't exist. That's how you do it. I bet you can relate to that. Huh? Mm -hmm. I mean, standing right next to you, you just keep on talking to somebody just like I did, wasn't even there. You know how to ignore folk. Well, you ignore those. Ignore their right to dictate your lifestyle. Not deny their existence because they exist. Look at it. While we do not look at the things which are seen. He didn't tell us to deny that they're there. He said, just don't look at them. Well, what do I look at? I look at the promise of God. What does God say about those things I see? Okay, watch this now. While we do not look at the things which are seen or perceived by the senses, but at the things which are not perceived not seen or perceived by the senses. What are those things? Those are the things 
of faith. Those are the things that we can't see with the natural eye. Those are the things that faith is the evidence or proof of based on God's word. That's what we look at. We look at the promise of God. The circumstance, they tell me I'm going down. The word of God says I'm going up. I have a choice. What am I going to look at? We have more confidence in what the senses tell us than we do in what God tells us. And the thing about it that's so awesome is ha, God's the one that created the senses. So if he tells you not to look at them, then he must know what he'd be talking about. Right? Okay. He says, while we do not look at the things which are seen or perceived by the senses, but at the things which are not seen or perceived by the senses. Why, Paul? For or because the things which are seen or perceived by the senses are temporary, temporal, or subject to change. But the things which are not perceived by the senses are eternal and everlasting. They never change. Everything in the physical, three-dimensional environment around us is in flux. It means it's changing. Even though you may not perceive it or see it, it's changing. In fact, if you don't believe it, go find your high school graduation picture, look at it, and then go look in the mirror. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Uh-huh. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We all change. Everything changes. Everything changes. That's, that is perceived by the senses. It's all temporal or temporary. The only thing that's eternal is the everlasting word of Almighty God. It cannot fail. So instead of looking at the things, we don't deny the things. We don't say they're not there. Sickness is there. If sickness wasn't there, you couldn't be healed by Jesus' stripes because if there's no sickness, there's nothing to be healed of. Wouldn't God know that? So faith doesn't say that bad things don't exist. Faith says, I don't look at them to allow them the luxury of telling me how I live my life. I let God's word be my guideline. I go by what God says by his word, for his word is forever settled in heaven. Are you following me? So to walk by faith doesn't mean you deny that sickness is there, you deny poverty is there, you deny the pain is there. No, you don't deny it. You just don't look at it. In other words, you don't allow it to tell you how to live your life. So if I'm, if I'm, in, if I'm in pain or something's wrong, and, and I believe I received my healing, but I'm still in pain. I'm up all night long. Keep up the, I'm keeping the kids awake, keeping the dog, the cat. Both of them are awake. They're howling and screeching because I'm whining all night long because I'm in pain. So what am I supposed to do? I, if I were you, I'd get you some pain medicine. <laughs> now, see, I didn't say that to be funny, but I said it because there are those There are those that think that because to walk by faith means that I don't take any medicine. Well, I don't if I don't need it. But if I need it, I take it. Why? Medicine can't cure you. But it can affect the symptoms that are keeping your tail awake at night and not allowing you to sleep so you can't go to work and come to church and sit here and sleep while the pastor is teaching because you've been up all night fighting the pain. All the medication is going to do is anesthetize your whatever so that you're not aware of the pain. It's not going to take it away because if it did, you wouldn't have to pray or believe anything. Just take the medicine and cancer would leave. Take the medicine and all the rest of the stuff would go away. But I know when I first got started, that's, they, they almost had us in bondage. Just scared to take anything. Scared to take a, uh, you know, aspirin. Well, if I'm going to walk by faith, I can't take medication. I don't know why. Who do you think invented medication? The devil? I don't think so. If it was left to Satan, there wouldn't be any doctors or operations or treatments or medication. He'd let you die. God did it to help his kids who are going to a lot of these churches where they never learn anything. Keep them alive until they can get to a place like this and find out their covenant rights and be able to overcome it. So don't let anybody put you in bondage. I don't look to the medication. I don't look to Advil to heal me. 
but it deals with the present pain. I'm believing God that I'm healed because, see, remember this. Pain is not causative. Pain is symptomatic. It is telling you it's an alert system that God built into your body to alert you something is wrong. When that red light comes on the dashboard of your car saying your engine oil is low, you better do something about it or you're going to burn the engine up. It's not trying to scare you. Try to warn you, keep you from ruining a good vehicle. And so the pain factors are built into your body so that you can know if you didn't know you had pain. If you kept putting your hand on the fire and you didn't feel anything from it, you could burn your hand up and not know it. So the pain alerts you. Right away you move out of there. Are you following me? I mean, I, I never will forget when I first started out in this and God was sending me all over the country ministering. I went down to a place in Kentucky. And, uh, oh, Lord Jesus. And there, there, was a, there was a man, I won't mention his name, but, but he was being, I guess, used of God very prominently in the charismatic renewal. And his main thing was, you take no medicine. If you really believe God, you don't take any medicine and you don't have any insurance. That's absolutely right. And, then I, and I didn't know all of this when I was first invited to this meeting. And so I'm in this meeting, and this guy spoke before me. And he got up with all that stuff, and I'm saying to myself, man, the poor sheep are already demoralized enough and confused. Now, what's it going to look like if I get up and refute all of this garbage that this guy was spewing out? And I could do it from the Word of God. It put me in a real, real bad position. See, watch this. Listen very carefully. you learn something. What he was doing, and many like him, he was not having faith in the word of God. His faith was in not taking medicine. You didn't get that. You didn't get that. See, his faith was in not having insurance. He had people in body, and he ended up dying himself or something. Because he probably wouldn't take any medication. <laughs> no, I mean to deal with, with the symptom. If you don't do something, I'm telling you, if that light comes on and it tells you your engine oil is low and you don't do anything about it, you'll burn that engine up. I remember one time when I was very, very young and I got up with a bunch of our, my crime partners. We were just seven, I was 18, they were 17, and we, were gonna, we stole this car. And, and we were going to, really, we were going to go to Mexico and we were going to start a steal, stealing cars and selling them. <laughs> crazy. I mean, it's crazy, but when you're a kid, you do, you know, you do some dumb things. And, and so, and so the, the guy that was, that, that, whose car we were riding in, it, it was a car that his father had given him, and we were going to go down and he was going to let us off and we would steal the cars and then we'd sell the cars and we'd have a way to get back in his car. And he didn't take care of the car like he should. And, and, and we, were, we were driving along. It, I, this is God's honest truth. We were driving along, and the car started going. Rrr, 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 rrr. God is my witness. We, opened, we stopped the car and opened the hood. The engine was white hot. It had frozen up because of no oil. It's ruined. But if he had paid attention to the warning lights... He wouldn't have suffered the loss. And many times Christians do that. What does insurance have to do with faith? To have or not to have, that is the question. <laughs> well, and people are so gullible Christians, and that's why they need somebody that will give them the real truth without any mess. Okay, if, if, if walking by faith means you don't have insurance because you believe in God that you'll never have an accident, so that means then God has to control all the other crazy drivers, <laughs> keep them from doing something dumb and hitting your car. So then if you don't have insurance and you really believe that that means I'm walking by faith because I don't have any insurance, well, then tell me why you are using deodorant. <laughs> why don't you believe God that you're never going to smell if you don't use deodorant and take all the money you've been spending on deodorant and give it into the kingdom. Because that's all deodorant is, is an insurance policy. <laughs> I wonder if I'm right about that. Amen. 
And then if you want to really get technical about it, if not having any insurance is, means you're walking by faith, then why do you have locks on your house, locks on your car? The insurance is irrelevant and immaterial, but it can be a hedge against the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy and taking everything that belongs to you. My wife and I were on a preaching mission one time. We left our daughter at home, and uh, she, she had the car while we were gone, and she was in a line of traffic. The car in front of her did a panic stop. <clears throat> she couldn't stop quick enough and ran into the back of the car in front of her, messed up our car more than it did the other guy's car. And uh, the guy got out of the car and, and looked like everything was all right. So then they started exchanging driver's license and insurance stuff. And because she didn't, she didn't have it, the guy, all of a sudden, he was hurt now. And so when we got home from our trip, got a telephone call from some, I don't know, lawyer, insurance, somebody representing this guy about the accident. I didn't even waste time talking to the dude. I said, uh, here's the number of my insurance agent, and I haven't heard from them till this day. Because they were getting ready. Because, see, I don't know about here, but California is a ripoff when it comes to, to suing. They'll sue you for anything. And they thought they had a, a, a fish on the hook. But, see, all that insurance did, it didn't stop the accident from happening. And thank God, God and his angels kept her from getting hurt. That's the most important thing. Cars can be replaced. Amen but my children cannot be replaced. And so the insurance kept the devil from trying to steal from us through a lawsuit. Are you following me? Because we're not perfect. I mean, I'm not. I know these first three rows, I can tell that y'all are absolutely perfect. So y'all don't need any locks on your house and no, you don't have, no, none of you use deodorant because y'all walking by faith. Are you seeing what I'm talking about? We had, a, we had another situation. We first started out in this. We had a lady in, the, in, in, our, in our church. Who had a, she had two boys, and she was a, a single mother. And the boys got on, this one guy got on drugs. He got all messed up. Anyway, long story short, made him, left him blind. And uh, so he couldn't see, so she had to take care of him. And we were on a trip somewhere in another part of the country. And unknown to us, she misunderstood as much as I made it a point to try to explain it to her. Tell him I'm not here. I'll call him back later. Uh, she uh, did something that was foolish. She didn't get it from me, but some kind of way she didn't understand it. And so we didn't know this, but she had insurance, medical insurance. She canceled it. We didn't know this. See, she canceled the insurance. So while we were on this trip, some kind of way she... Uh, I can't remember whether she ran the bath water for him to take a bath. Some kind of way he tripped, fell into the bathtub and drowned in the bathtub. And when we got back to, well, actually we heard about the call us on the phone and let us know about it. Come to find out she had no insurance. She couldn't even bury the boy. So the church had to do it. Well, at least the insurance would have paid for a burial. See what I mean? See, we're not perfect. And sometimes we do things inadvertently. Have you ever stumbled and fell somewhere? I know you did it on purpose, didn't you? <laughs> you felt like a jack and wondered, how could I have been that dumb to trip over that? But we're not perfect, so we, we need help. Some of those things, they can help us. Our faith, my faith's not in insurance. My faith's not in medication. But I use it just like I use other tools to ward off the enemy and to deal with things that until the manifestation comes. As I started to say earlier when I was over here, pain is, is, is not causative. It's... It's symptomatic. So even though you anesthetize the pain so you're not consciously aware of it, you still got to deal with what caused the pain. And that's where your faith comes in. You use your faith on the cause. Once the cause goes, the pain is automatically gone. But in the meantime, I got to go to work. I can't stay home and I can't do my job with this throbbing pain about to blow my brains out. I need some help. So my, when I take the pill, it's not because I don't believe God. I'm only dealing with symptoms. Okay? So, you, so it's not automatically faith because you don't use medication, you don't go to the doctor, you won't have treatment, you won't have operation, and you don't have insurance, <laughs> or you don't use deodorant. Hallelujah. It doesn't automatically mean that you're in faith. So don't get 
you know, hung out on that. Now, I don't argue with folk. I don't argue. It's fine with me if that's what you believe and you want to do, that's fine. But just know, don't try to put that off on somebody else because not really not what the Word says. Are you following me? So faith is not denying the circumstances. It's just simply not allowing them to dictate the terms of your life. Now, while you're right there in 2 Corinthians, look at the fifth chapter, verse 7. It says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Well, what does that mean? It simply means we walk by the word and not by the senses. We walk by the word, not by the senses. In other words, again, we don't allow the senses to dictate to us and tell us how to live our lives. We abide by them when we need to. Like I said last night, when I get ready to cross the freeway out there, I don't cross by faith, I cross by sight. <laughs> I'm looking in all the directions because I have been a hit and run victim by an automobile before. Satan tried to take me out when I was very young. Hit dead on, should have been killed. Only the angels of God preserved me and another young man that was with me at that time. It was just kids. So I don't cross any street without looking north, south, east, west, down, and up. <laughs> just might be a buzzard flying overhead or something <laughs> inside to drop some, you know, what on me and I can't see. And I step out in the highway and get hit by a car. I ain't going there. Amen. <laughs> 